Hello, my name is Sarah and I am your chakra coach. On this podcast, we'll be exploring how the chakra system can help guide you to grow your emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual wellness, leading you closer to your highest self. This episode of Your Chakra Coach is brought to you by Blissoma Skin Care. Blissoma is where beauty grows from balance. Their holistic focus marries phytochemistry with your biology to organically address the root causes of skin problems. They work authentically and compassionately, providing an honest and restorative experience with the world's most nutritious plants in their whole raw forms. Blossoms, berries, barks, and roots are chosen especially for specific skin needs, including sensitivities, breakouts, and more. Careful research and intelligent curation match the right plants with the right people for amazing results. I've been using the products for just a few weeks now, and I can already see a difference in my skin. And right now, Blissoma is offering you 30% off trial skincare sets. Each set contains a curated range of deluxe trial size products so that you can test out a complete routine of five products at an affordable price. The set should last about two weeks of daily use. There's a link in the show notes and use coupon code CHAKRACOACH, all one word, to be sure you get your 30% discount. I hope you love them as much as I do. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I hope that you are doing well. I'm doing great today, and I'm so excited to share this episode with you. I had the pleasure of meeting and chatting with Ananta Ripa Ajmera this week after reading her amazing book called The Way of the Goddess. In it, she takes us through each chakra and a goddess that represents the aspects of the energy center. She shares the story, the mythology of the goddess, and also how the lessons apply to our modern lives right now and to our healing and spiritual growth. Uh, Each chapter has healing practices to help you connect with the goddess to tap into the power that already exists in you. And along the way, Ananta shares her own story of growth and healing, which is really inspiring. Ananta is an award-winning author, a spiritual teacher, co-founder and CEO of The Ancient Way. That's an organization that supports you to embody ancient wisdom in a way that unfold your true self. The Ancient Way offers a spiritual warrior certification program, uh, Ayurveda, Ayurveda wellness ambassador program, and spiritual wellness retreats. She is also the advisor of Ayurveda at The Well, a modern wellness club where she writes articles, offers workshops, and works with a team of integrative medical practitioners. She is also the author of The Ayurveda Way, And her work has been featured in Newsweek, Forbes, Vogue, Yoga Journal, Spirituality and Health Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, Well and Good, Mind Body Green, and on ABC News and Fox News. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, welcome, Ananta. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. I loved reading your book. It was beautifully written. The stories are amazing. And I just, I really felt as I was reading that I was on a journey with you, right? Not just I was on your journey, but also that you were a guide on my own personal journey as I went through. And I can't wait to set aside a a nine day period to really dig in and kind of immerse myself into it. But I would love to know sort of what, what is the personal journey that brings you to write a book like this, you know, the way of the goddess, that's, you know, that's a lot, the way of the goddess. So tell me a little bit about how you got to this point and a little bit about you. Let's get to know you. Okay. Thank you. Great question. I actually, to be perfectly honest with you, never in my wildest dreams thought I would ever write a book about the goddess. This was something that I did not understand growing up as a young girl of Indian immigrants in Ohio. 
we used to go to our Indian temples, the Hindu temples, and would celebrate these festivals, including a goddess festival called Navratri, which was the nine night goddess festival that my book actually takes you on a journey through. I never understood Navratri growing up. I never understood why, first of all, we even had so many gods and goddesses and what they even meant. It actually really frustrated me that I didn't understand my own traditions that I was being presented and that we were asked to do things without understanding them. I wanted to know what is it that these gods and goddesses actually mean? Why are they there? What purpose do they serve? And how can I connect with them? I left the question kind of as is in childhood and went to Catholic private all girls high school. Interesting. I actually, yeah, I actually begged my parents to send me because in childhood, I had gone to Bible school with my neighbors because we shared the same babysitter while my parents were working in the daytime. And I remember inviting Jesus into my heart at a young age and loving this idea that God, divinity, can live within my own heart. It felt a lot more accessible to me than these statues of gods and goddesses in our Indian temples. And I carried that memory with me. And by the time I became a teenager, I wanted to know more about Jesus, that who I had invited into my heart. And I wanted to know about Mother Mary. And I wanted to know all these things that felt more clear and easy to understand. So I went to Catholic high school and I loved it. And I did learn a lot. And I did connect even more deeply with Jesus and especially with Mother Mary, because she is so evoked in the Notre Dame tradition of the high school that I went to. By the time I got to college, I was quite disconnected actually from my own Indian roots and cultural upbringing. I kind of rejected the whole thing just out of not understanding it and kind of connecting it with the very patriarchal society India actually is. Oh, that's so interesting. And Okay, go on. Sorry, that's just, there's so many parts to that, but yeah, go on. Yeah, 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 it is. It's very interesting, even to me. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got to college and I went to a yoga class in New York City because I was a stressed out New Yorker. And I always knew though, even then that yoga is more than exercise. I didn't know the connections to the Vedic spiritual tradition or the Hindu religion at all. I just knew, though, that there's more to it than exercise and breathing. Right. <laughs> Something spiritual, but I don't quite know what. It was so interesting to go to the yoga class, which is offered by completely Western people. I didn't see any Indians in the class except for myself. And yet to hear the same Sanskrit mantras that I had heard in the Hindu temples and to actually see those same images of the Hindu gods and goddesses in the yoga center. So I'm like, I'm getting closer to kind of putting some dots together here. And then I loved in the class itself when the teacher said that yoga is a spiritual practice that prepares us to live a life of service. Living a life of service was always very important to me growing up. I knew from a very young age that my purpose on this planet is to live a life of service. How I would do that, I had no idea. I told my dad, I want to be the executive director of the Red Cross. <laughs> he said, why don't you go to business? <laughs> yeah. So he's like, why don't you just go to business school? Because, you know, even if that's really what you want to do, you'll learn how to do it, first of all, by going to business school. And then if you don't want to do it, you'll have a nice business degree from the NYU undergraduate business school. So he kind of talked me into that. And I really honestly hated all the business accounting statistics finance classes in college it wasn't exactly the service you had in mind <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but then we got to a point in my second year of school where I discovered that there's this whole field called social entrepreneurship where you can combine business skills with the humanitarian kind of service that I wanted to do 
I was really excited about that. I found out about that around the same time I stumbled into that yoga class as a stressed out business student, not sure how I'm going to translate what I'm learning into service. I remember starting that scholarship program. I was really fortunate to be one of nine undergraduates who got accepted into it along with some graduate students. And we had begun our journey with a question, which is what does being the change you wish to see in the world mean to you? And I internalized that by asking myself a question, which then led me on this whole quest, which then led to me writing this book. And that question was, how can I create pattern breaking change in a sustainable way within my own life and then scale those changes into the work I wish to do to be of service in the world. Social entrepreneurship was always such an external thing about helping other people, but I always felt that true leadership means leading by example. And I knew that the only way I would really feel at peace with myself and the service I would do would be by embodying what I teach and actually benefiting from what I offer to the world first and foremost. So that journey, that question actually led me on a journey to go deeper into that yoga because it was connecting things for me. And then it led me back to India after I had not visited India or any family members who live in India for all my teenage years. Then I went back to India. I was actually still a teenager at 19, almost 20. And I realized, wow, India has a lot of spiritual service organizations. And I went to one of them at the Gandhi Ashram. And there I met a young girl named Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the name of the most widely worshipped Hindu goddess of wealth. Anywhere you go in India, any business you enter of, you know, Hindu people in India, you will see a shrine of Lakshmi because people <laughs> are looking for that support. And this young girl had been sent to the organization because she had gone through sexual abuse in her childhood and it had really you know, harmed her and shut her down. And she was, you know, really sad and, and scared. And her parents had sent her to that center at the Gandhi Ashram to better herself, to get an education, to have a better life. And I just was really struck by that. We worship goddesses in India, and yet we don't see that same goddess in young girls and in women. And what if we could, you know, that question also came right then and there. What if we could? And I think I had seen so much of my own childhood and my own self reflected in that young girl's eyes that it became a mission then to understand, first of all, what on earth are these goddesses and how can we find their power within us everyone talks about goddesses these days not everyone but many people sure but you hear about, about it all that lots of t- throwing it around oh goddess embrace your inner goddess the goddess circle right there's lots of talk about it so but you are yeah. on a mission to discover truly the heritage the the embodiment of these goddesses exactly and i often feel that when people say embody your goddess channel your inner goddess it's often an invitation to connect with the physical body and with sensuality. And that the ultimate of being a goddess is being physically beautiful, wearing certain kind of clothes and kind of feeling comfortable with one's sexuality. Yeah. It's not always that way, but I feel it's often that way. But and it definitely feels like that's a thread through a lot of that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I was even hesitant when I wanted to write this book that I need to also First of all, I needed to understand what is a goddess. And for me right away, because I had met that girl, I had realized it was important to look within to find that. When I was a child, I was also dressed to be like a goddess in a competition about That's who could look That's such an adorable, slightly like disturbing story. <laughs> in your book. I loved it. I was just like, oh my gosh, that's so so cute. Oh my gosh, that doesn't seem right. (laughs) But see, this is kind of what we do, right? We, We often are on the surface with things. And so when we really look at it, what 
this goddess tradition is teaching us is how to achieve the whole goal and purpose of human life, which is way beyond being embodied in a healthy and strong way. It's actually about realizing your own divinity. And what they say in the Vedic spiritual tradition is that a human being minus desires equals God or goddess. And this path has actually been created with lots of gods and goddesses in order for us humans to have role models to look up to, to face life's challenges. And I had lots of challenges following the traumas that I had gone through in my childhood and that I've written about in this book. And I always wanted a strong, powerful female role model to look up to. I somehow didn't find that in the way that I needed in my life. But then when I revisited this goddess tradition, I found that in the warrior mother goddess Durga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's my role model. That's actually how I need to be both compassionate and kind and forgiving, which is kind of the mother part, right, of Durga, but also a warrior and fierce and strong and bold and brave and ready to battle with the inner demons and the inner obstacles and the inner fears and the inner, you know, anger and frustration and worries and all the demons in the mind that actually stand in the way of us realizing who we really are as embodied spiritual divine beings in every aspect of life, not just in terms of our relationship with our bodies or our sensuality. That is one small part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But also there's a whole aspect of this tradition, which is about being able to control our senses, to pull back our senses and to actually channel that energy into developing our spiritual power so that we can actually transcend our attachments and our cravings and desires at the physical level. Because whether we have desires at a physical level, at an emotional level, or even at an intellectual level, even a desire for more knowledge, that desire itself will prevent us from realizing the truth of who we really are, which is the whole reason why we are actually alive. And to realize that we can't be passive about it. We have to be armed with weapons to support us. And as I got deeper and deeper into understanding this goddess tradition, into studying the science of Ayurveda, the sister science of yoga, which teaches us about healthy living, as I studied about yoga and its psychology and its philosophy and its underlying spiritual teachings of Vedanta, which are from the end portion of the Vedas, I felt that the goddess mythology and this idea of stories and that these stories we've heard in our mythology are actually connected to powers within each of our chakras was very appealing to me. And just putting things together in this holistic way at a physical level, mostly for the first three chakras, at an emotional level for the second three chakras, and at a kind of intellectual and spiritual level for the last three chakras became such an incredible framework to go through the Navratri festival And it always led me to incredible breakthroughs in my own life. So as I got deeper and deeper into my studies, I was like, why don't I just make every day into this goddess festival internally? I don't have to tell anybody else. I don't have to do any kind of outer thing. But for me, it became about let me remember just one goddess, one power each and every day in order. And then I always find that my life situations and circumstances and how I view them actually align to make it so that that particular teaching is highlighted. And I'll start doing things to cultivate the power of stability in the first chakra, creativity in the second, transformation in the third, love in the fourth, voice in the fifth, intuition in the sixth, transcendence or truth in the seventh, rejuvenation in the eighth and intention in the ninth. And then at the 10th day of the each cycle, I always just 
really reflect and integrate all of the kind of practices and experiences of the previous nine days. And I just find that it has personally been a never ending catalyst for personal transformation and growth that I can will into being. And I found that it has helped me to heal all kinds of issues within myself that then have automatically restored health in all my relationships with other people, with the world, and how to work in the world while also feeling peace in one's own, in my own mind and heart. And I'm like, golly, if I have benefited <laughs> this much from it, then here writing this book is my answer to my question. This is the way that I have been able to find sustainable peace and changes to those patterns within myself, which were self-destructive. And I've been able to do it for a long time now. And so my next step naturally out of gratitude feels to express it, to write it, to share it, and to do so in a way where I'm always continuously striving to keep living it and to keep deepening it for myself. So first, you literally were the change you wanted to see in the world. And this book is a way to put that change into the world. And it goes right back to you always looking for a way to be of service, which is you cover in, I think, the ninth chapter of your book, you know, having the intention to serve others. And that, I mean, it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful framework. It's so organized and um, I don't want to say easy, but it's very, it's simple. It's straightforward. It's, uh, it's just, it, when you read it, you feel very like, oh, how did I not already know this? As if it was <laughs> like, as if it was knowledge that existed in the world. And then your book sort of just channeled it right back into me where I'd somehow let go of it is how I kind of felt reading that book. And I do, I wanted to go back to the Catholic school thing, because I think it's funny of so many Catholic traditions have that element of service to them. So there must have been part of that that really spoke to you as well, since you've been yes. sort of this service minded, service heart person. It sounds like your whole life. So I'm fascinated by the fact that you have found that part of every belief system, a part of every faith. And you say very clearly, you, you don't have to give up any anything that you believe in. You don't need to give up your faith. You don't need to change your beliefs, right? It all can kind of fit together into this, into this system, into this philosophy of the the goddesses and the chakra system, which I found just to be so beautiful. So I did want to ask you about goddesses in particular. So in Western religions or traditions, we don't have a lot of female role models. I I mean, I suppose you mentioned. Mother Mary, which is maybe the closest there is in some of our, you know, broad Western traditions. It's not all of them. There are, you know, Celtic traditions that have a lot of uh, female role models and, and Roman and goddesses and Greek goddesses and such like that. Uh, we just don't, now we don't think of that as being something that you can follow in your life. We don't think of it as being, nobody's like, I follow a Greek mythology religion, right? That's just not something that I you see much. Tell me a little bit about reconnecting to the goddess aspect of the Hindu culture. And you mentioned, you know, the, the patriarchy in India, which is, of course, very strong, as strong as stronger maybe than it is here in the U.S. But having that tradition to kind of lean on, to kind of, you know, be cradled by as you move forward with your own personal healing and then in this book, tell me a little bit about having goddesses and what that meant to you. It felt like coming home when I finally started to unearth the symbolic mythological meaning of the goddesses and knowing that they are presented for that purpose. In the Hindu faith and in the Vedanta spirituality, it really is a universal spirituality. It's even strange that they call Hinduism a religion because Hinduism is the only religion that will say all paths are valid because there are different paths that lead to one truth. And wasn't I reading just the other day, I think, about, you know, Hindu, Hinduism was sort of a name given by the British colonists to 
sort of just like be like, okay, great. Now we have a label for these people, right? So yeah. it wasn't until <laughs> until they got there, nobody in India or in that region of the country was thought to themselves, I am a Hindu. They just wasn't that just wasn't how it was thought of. Exactly. Yeah, because it's all about Sanatan Dharma, which is following and living by the universal way and living by universal values that are common to all beings, right? So that's why it's so strange to kind of think that it's a religion. And there are, though, Hindu fundamentalists. So even I try not to use that word too much to kind of connect with my work. And I technically even wasn't raised as a Hindu per se. I was raised in the Jain religion, Mm -hmm. which is a subsect of Hinduism, kind of like how Buddhism is a subsect of Hinduism. It kind of like derived its source from Hinduism as a mother tradition, and then it branched off into its own religion. Right. And and here I am, having grown up, Jane, went to a Catholic high school and wrote a book about Hindu goddesses. So it's like, is this is this woman really confused about I religion? I kind of love what? it. I kind <laughs> of love it because it speaks to the part of me that really is like, does it matter? Does it matter what you believe? Or are we truly all, if I'm going to believe we're all one, You know, it gives me a different lens from which to read religious texts from every tradition. And at a certain point, I'm just like, they're kind of all saying the same thing. They are saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So for the past few years, I've been studying the Vedanta spiritual philosophy from Swami Parthasarthi, who is a 95-year-old guru based in India. And what he always points out is that The whole purpose of religion is the same as that of yoga. Religion means to return back to one's own original state, which is that inherent divinity. Yoga is union with that higher self, with that original state of being. And all of the religions have personified desire of any kind as the demon that blocks us from God, right? So in Christianity, it's called Satan. In Hinduism, it's called Asura. In Buddhism, it's called Mara. In Islam, it's Shaitan. But they all have these different words for the same phenomena. And they're all teaching us about how to return back to who we truly are. So if people truly followed their own religions, you know, and really understood them, we would definitely have a lot more peace in the world. And mm. even people who don't subscribe, say, to religions, but believe in a higher power, right? Or a higher presence that connects us all and that is common to us and that there is a soul that lives within us and in each living being, then, you know, we wouldn't have all these conflicts. So it really sure. is important we to We wouldn't understand. try to put all of these divisions exactly. within, our, within ourselves. Yeah. Exactly. So it's really important to do ourselves a favor to go and understand what any tradition has to say and then to realize that they are actually all expressing that same truth in different ways. And so when you found the the goddesses and you went back and really kind of dug deep into that tradition, is that what you discovered then? That like these were all different ways of expressing the different parts of you? Just tell me more about that. I'm so interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the Vedanta spiritual philosophy of yoga and Ayurveda and uh, the Vedic tradition, we actually have what is called Brahman. Brahman is universal supreme consciousness. Brahman has no name, no form, no qualities, no attributes. Now, For us regular human beings to try to relate to that and to try to relate to that which is infinite, which has no name, which has no form, which has no qualities, it's just kind of hard to fathom. I'm sorry, Ananta, my brain is too small for that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm too small. And so in in their great kindness, the sages who were revealed this great truth of Brahman in their lives through their meditations and through their connection with nature have been very creative in endowing humanity with all kinds of role models in the form of gods and goddesses. So when I understood that a goddess and goddess Durga, the warrior mother goddess, whose journey is chronicled in my new book, 
is actually Brahman in a form purposely for us to be able to relate to Brahman in a more human way was really amazing. I'm like, wow, that's so nice of the sages to create oh these motherly beings. Because Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. <laughs> more than our fathers, we're really connected to our mothers, right? Like we literally live in our mother's womb for nine months. She is the first presence or even aware of the first person we see when we come out of her womb and therefore our first teacher in many ways and some energy that we really relate to as human beings when we cry we often cry for our mothers right and so this idea of the divine as a feminine entity or as a mother as that compassionate caring being is very comforting to the soul. I, I feel it's very emotionally soothing. It's very like a relief that, oh, great. You know, so when I cry, I can just imagine that this very powerful mother goddess is there for me. It is really, really empowering. And then not only is this goddess there for me, but lives within me mm -hmm. was also just, I mean, it just goes beyond words to come to realize this and to understand that it's symbolism and mythology but it's also a direct connection to powerful role models just felt so complete it gave me everything I ever needed wanted or was looking for I and I I think I felt the same way as I was reading because there were so many different aspects so many different uh incarnations of the goddess Durga that I was like oh wow oh look at that and you know you do such a lovely job of saying, you know, this is the goddess that can help you create stability, find that goddess within you. Right. And I thought it was fascinating to be reminded that those qualities are already within me. I just have to find them. Right. It's not some sort of thing that I need to go reach for the outside for. I don't need to uh, find the creativity someplace out there. Right. I can just tap into it from the universal consciousness or you know, truly that inner goddess. And I, you just did such a nice job of explaining how the story is relatable to right now, right? And I think we struggle a lot with that, with looking at ancient stories and saying, well, how is that relevant to right now? And I just found it really uh, helpful and clear and interesting um, and moving to explore the goddesses, the incarnations at each level, you know, and it's the story of a of a woman, you know, going through a, a complete transformation. And I thought, you know, it was the story of you going through a complete transformation and a roadmap for us as your readers to go through a complete transformation, you know, and, and healing from the inside out. Right. And at the very end, you know, shedding all of those layers and becoming a, a child again, almost. Right. And I just, I don't know. I just thought the whole thing was beautiful and inspiring in such a beautiful way to look at the chakra system. So would you tell us a little bit about the the nine day festival, the festival of nine nights that inspired you? Yeah, sure. So the nine night festival of Navratri, which means nine, Nav is nine, Ratri is nights, is one in which we evoke the power of the warrior mother goddess Durga in her nine different incarnations or avatars, which are said to reside in our nine chakras in the form of different powers that lie dormant within us. The first night of the festival, we're connecting with the root chakra and the power of stability. And it's just so amazing to me how these characters are connected to nature. So for example, the first day we're connecting with the earth, we're connecting with our roots, we're connecting with this idea of becoming stable and grounded on our journey. And then we are channeling that energy and we are transforming, we're able to connect and open our heart and speak our truth. And, you know, it's, it's so much more than what I understood it to be growing up. 
growing up, I actually opened the book this way that I just thought Navratri was pomegranate seeds, puffed <laughs> rice, and lots of dancing during the nine day festival. You're a kid. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it was fun, but it was confusing as heck. Of course, like, of course why it was. is there a lamp in the middle? And <laughs> you know, why do we dance with sticks? Because I didn't write about the stick dance, but there's also a stick dance that we do. And you're literally like, I have two sticks, you would have two sticks in the dance, and we hit each other's sticks in the dance. And it's just so like, why? You know, like what are we doing? And then you go around. So there's a lot of people with their own sticks, two each in their hands and you just like we do our stick dancing sequence together then we move on to the next dancing partner and then we do our stick dancing sequence together and we keep going like that again also in a circle I didn't know because nobody explained it to me that this is actually symbolic of the weapons that the goddess had used to destroy the greatest demon on the 10th day of the Navratri journey. So warrior, each of the warrior mother, warrior mother goddess. I love that combo, by the way, the warrior goddess, who's also a mother. I think that's fascinating. Go on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and that's really the whole purpose of the festival. It's not just to eat pomegranate seeds and have puffed rice and dance your heart out with loud music and colorful costumes. That's all there. And people have really, you know, maxed out on that for the fun of it. And you'll see that wherever there's Indian people throughout the world, this will be a colorful time of year. It's usually in September, October, and it's fun. You know, a lot of non-Indian people would come and join just because it's fun and colorful and exciting but it's actually more exciting than we even know because it's teaching us every single day about a battle within ourselves that we have the power deep within ourselves to conquer so every day this warrior mother goddess is defeating a different demon within ourselves and then on the 10th day of this journey she defeats the greatest demon which none of the male deities incidentally were able to defeat so they have imbued her endowed her with their weapons and entrusted her with all their powers to go and defeat that demon because only she mm -hmm. can defeat that great demon i love that so much and i love that in the story only a woman could do it right there's an acknowledgement of the power inherent in women right and it's the creation it's I think it's a fortunate aspect of the tradition. I think there's definitely unfortunate aspects of all traditions, of course. Uh, but I think that's a very, uh, a, a beautiful thing that I love that it gave you a place to go home to. And then, yeah. and, the, and then that you were willing to share that with us. So I'm grateful on two fronts. Oh, thank you. And you know what's, I think also so beautiful about this idea of the divine feminine and of the woman and of mother mothering is that that lamp, which is in the center of the dance of the Garba, which is called the Deepa Jyot, is the light. And the idea of that Garba dance going in a circle is actually that it's representing the multiplicity of life. And that light in the middle is representing that power that we all actually have, regardless of what kind of body we have or how we identify with our body to give birth in each and every moment to the highest and most authentic version of our own self. And so even for those of us who are in female bodies, I feel it gives us permission to also look at what is mothering in a much bigger way than just reproducing ourselves biologically. But it's really like embracing that divine feminine attribute or quality of creation and recreation and transformation in any kind of body. And I feel that that makes it actually so inviting for anyone of any kind of culture or religion or body or gender to really connect with. And that's why at the Garba dances and even this Dandia Ras is what it's called, where you're with the sticks dancing with different people. 
it was always men and women. Mm -hmm. Everyone was included, you know, and I just love this idea of, of the womb. Garba means womb. So this dance is symbolizing the womb because in a lot of religious traditions, we have the monastic idea of renunciation and leaving the world behind. And often women get personified as distractions, right? Yeah. Of the senses. That's right. And so then here is the spiritual tradition, the oldest tradition of the world saying, actually, that reproductive aspect of women, what gives us the ability to give life, to give birth is something we're not only going to say yes to, but we're going to celebrate with great fervor and enthusiasm. And, and we're gonna I love what you said it. about, oh, sorry, please go. And we're going to celebrate it even beyond the original idea of what we might have of giving birth in into something much bigger than that right and we can all be birth givers in that sense in so many different ways right it doesn't matter what your body is it doesn't matter if you identify as a woman or a man or neither or both or whatever it is right you know you have the capacity for creation and care and compassion and strength and that warrior mother goddess, right? Everybody has that in them because we all have all of divinity in us, not just parts of it that we relate to a god or parts of it that relate to a goddess. Um, and it sounds like this this festival doesn't just acknowledge that, it puts it at the forefront for over a week. You know, we get to think about that. And that's so, that's beautiful, really lovely. Well, thank you. Um, that was so fascinating and so interesting. And I just, I feel like I'm going to go read your book again after this conversation. <laughs> and I'm going to recommend everybody read this book. I feel like the transformational power contained in it, you know, it, you just went through one 10 day cycle. You know, I feel like there could be massive change in your life and Look, learning to look at the different aspects of yourself in a different way as you go through it one by one. So Ananda, your book is out. Yeah, it's out. People can buy it on at stores. Where where can we get a copy? Sure. Yeah, you can basically get it anywhere books are sold. So Amazon, my local bookstore, Barnes and <laughs> Noble. I don't even know what's open anymore, but you, so anywhere. Do you, if people want to find out more about you, where should we send them? Where should they, where can they go? Sure. You can either visit my website, theancientway.co, not .com. Not .com, C-O. Mm -hmm. Or people can follow me on Instagram or Facebook at ananta.1, and one is spelled out, O-N-E. Okay. I will put links to that uh, in the show notes so that'll be easy to just click right on. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your journey with us and I think it's extremely generous when people are willing to be vulnerable like that in the written word to share with us. So you are appreciated and your work is much needed in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate your support. Absolutely. All right. We'll have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Isn't she great. Her energy and knowledge are so beautiful, don't you think? I'm going to link to her social media accounts, her website, and all that good stuff in the show notes so you can learn more about her and even get a copy of her book if you like. If you haven't already joined me on Instagram and Facebook, I would love for you to. It's Your Chakra Coach. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for reaching out with feedback and questions and ideas. You are an amazing community and I appreciate you all. And remember, if this show is positively impacting your life and you'd like to support me in making it, you can join the Patreon page where there's some bonus content, including meditations, yoga poses for the chakras, journaling prompts, and more. Until next time, I hope you have a fantastic week and we'll talk again soon. Bye.